We are back. Giants baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho. The host is Tim Haller from Southern California in the desert. I'm in Northern California, right by San Francisco across the bay in Alameda. And uh, we're going to be joined in a few moments by Vasu Pataparty, who is um, – just an expert on the Giants. He's in, uh, works with the media up here. He's with Fox, and uh, he's behind the scenes getting game notes to to announcers. And uh, he's a longtime San Francisco Giants exploit, and um, the longer time San Francisco expert is uh, right here on the line, Timmy Heller. How are you? Oh, I, I. I... I appreciate that, but I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert by any means. Um, well, I know that I, 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 love the, yeah, I, love, I love the Giants, that's for sure. But uh, you to have the, you yeah. are good uncles. If, you, if one could I, do that, um, if one could pick their family, you would have picked the best one or as good as, as any. Uh, your Uncle Bill... Bill Haller was with us last week, and um, it was delightful. Um, one of the highlights of, of my doing this, and I know it was fun for you, which uh, which is what all this is about. And uh, and more importantly, it was fun for him. He was glowing at the moving along and glowing by the end of the show, really enjoying it, and um, it was terrific. Absolutely, it was great, and uh, I know we'll have him on again shortly. Uh, but it was a pleasure for me. I was all smiles last week, that's for sure. Yeah, it took me a long time to come down for some of these things. I can't, I can't sleep at night. It's like um, I equate it to when I did comedy and you do a set on stage, and good, bad, or indifferent. There's all that much preparation and and doing it. And then there's the come down, the adrenaline. It's just like a baseball game, I'm sure. Have there been time? Were there times when you played ball when um, you just couldn't go to bed? I mean, it was just um, flowing. Absolutely. I mean, oh, absolutely. And, and uh, you know, I, I can imagine. I, I know for myself, the majority of the time, um, I would lay in bed and replay everything and go over certain things that happened uh, during the course of the day and, and then think about what am I going to do tomorrow to either improve upon it or try to do the same thing over. Um, I'm, I'm kind of that type of personality, though. I I can do that with about anything that I actually love. Um, it doesn't just necessarily have to be baseball, but I do know that I've lost a lot of sleep uh, thinking about the game. Um and over the last couple of weeks, I've lost a little sleep, Ralph. But the Giants have gone into a little bit of a slumber, uh, offensively anyway. We know that. Their bullpen uh, has before been... Before we get to that, let me just ask you the, the concluding question of the last conversation we had. Did you ever have a perfect game where you can say, well, you didn't have anything to criticize yourself about? Was there ever... You know, what I you know the only time, the only time I really I was much better amateur player I think than I was professionally, and uh, one thing that I did do which has not been accomplished since was a uh, doubleheader uh, in college. I hit for the cycle in both games. I went ten for ten and drove eighteen runs in the two games. So I mean, oh. in both games, I, in both games I hit grand slams. So. You know, that that probably to me is one of those days where you talk about being in the zone. Um, everything seemed to kind of just be, uh, you know, it was just everything has slowed down so much and I was in a good place. And, um, yeah, that was the best day of my life as a baseball player. Wow. I just got to say, two grand slams hitting for the cycle in both games of a doubleheader. Yep. <laughs> um, you you started to say I was a much better uh, am- 
amateur player than I was a pro player, and I was going to interrupt, don't be hard on yourself because of uh, your, the competition you're playing against, this, that, and the other thing, and you were rising to the top going. Oh, yeah, and, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I was a, a no, you know, a very... Bad. I don't think, I think I have to agree with you. You can. <laughs> that was as good a, a day in baseball um, as I, I've ever heard about anybody having on any level. So uh, yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a big day for me, uh, and it's something you know, one of those things you'll never forget. I think we have our guest on. That's who. Have you arrived to the show? I have. Thank you, Tim. Oh, I did not even <laughs> hear you, Vasu. I. I apologize. I should be alert for these things, but um, I should be alert for a lot of things. <laughs> I'm actually, I'm actually surprised Tim knew going. that. You didn't know that. I'm actually surprised that Tim knew that, and you didn't know that. Ah, okay. Well, Vasu, um, I gave you high praise. You're a giant expert. I want you guys to just rip it apart for a little while. I think they made a terrific trade this week. I, for a moment, I didn't understand quite why, uh, but now I realize they're not really convinced that Panic, because of the concussions, it, until he is back, that he's going to come back. One never knows, and uh, Matheny is a good example of that, and now um, Crawford's out for a little bit, Duffy's hurt. Tell, tell me about the trade they made. And I'm going to ask you guys if you like it as much as I do. As much as I do. Well, I like it. you got to go. Yeah, go no first. Oh, no, no, please. Please. Well, I was here today. The, the game was on Fox today, so I, so I was working today. But uh, And he came down. He came down yesterday about 6.30, 7 o'clock into the dugout. And uh, he's an all-star from the Minnesota Twins. And, and the funny thing was, and just to start off with a funny thing, was that when he came to the Giants, he's already tied with the league, with the team leader, the team leader in home runs, plus Raposi at 12, and he's going to be a utility guy for the most part for the rest of the year. And he's already made his impact today. If you guys watch the game today a little bit, he, uh, as, we, as we taped this on Saturday, he, he got a two-run double, he stole a base, he scored a couple runs, and they won the game, and they broke the three-game losing streak. So he's already made an impact. So I'm not sure exactly what uh, I'm not exactly sure what they were expecting when they got him to begin with. But he was already an all-star, and he already he's already made his presence. And he's going to be he's going to be a good guy at short seven third base. And this just tells me not that panic. And I heard you say about panic and and Duffy right. and all that. It's just a matter of it's just a matter of whether yeah. it's just a matter of whether he's going to replace. Panic or Duffy? I don't think that's the case. I think that Duffy's still going to be out for a little while. I think they're more worried about Duffy than they are about Panic. Uh, and he's going to, and he's probably going to play third base. He's probably going to play third base a little bit more. It's just a matter of what they're going to do. Has anybody mentioned the, the outfield? Does he have a strong enough arm to play maybe left field? Well, he's got a shortstop arm. I think left field is okay for, for that type of arm. That's what they were thinking. He played outfield for the Twins a little bit, from what I remember. Seeing when I was watching the satellite package, the Twins are on during the daytime a little bit uh, during the week. But I've seen him play the outfield a little bit in left field. And I, I think he'll be fine in left field. I mean, you want an offensive bat. The Giants are struggling offensively right now for these last 13 games. And I think the most important thing right now is to get that bat in. You can figure out how to play left field without worrying about that. So uh, I think he'll be all right in left field. But right now, today, he looked at his short. Crawford definitely needed a day off. He's been hitting some bad luck. I mean, I mean, he hit into a triple play yesterday for crying out loud. So, <laughs> right, welcome to the Giants. <laughs> yeah, really. Uh, welcome to the Giants right now. Hey, Timmy, what do you think? Well, I, I like the acquisition of Nunez too, um, and I, you know, and I'm kind of in in concurrence with Basu. I I think Joe Panic on the on the side of the Giants are really, you know, just uh, you know, very being very cautious. And slow in his comeback. Um, I know that concussions are, you know, a severe thing, but 
I think what they're doing is they're investing some time now to know that he'll be much, he'll be better later, obviously. Um, and Achilles tendon, and, 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 and in terms of what Matt Duffy's going through, <laughs> Jimmy, I'm not going to have to put you back in the yell, am I? I'm, I'm right here. I'm right here. In okay. terms of what Matt Duffy uh, is going through, he uh, he suffered a, a pretty bad strain, uh, but not a tear. Now, what they're trying to do is to make sure that that thing's going to hold up then for the last, you know, quarter of the season or so, or a little plus of the season. Because if that thing completely blows up on him, then he's going to be out for six to eight months. So, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely taking their time with him, um, because that could turn into something that's, you know, far more severe, I think. Um, but I, I like this kid Nunez. I think he's going to be a, you know, he's a, he's got, uh, major league time. Uh, he's, he's, he's played at a higher level than, say, you know, the guys that were filling in for the Giants. Um, so he has some experience. He is an all-star. Um, so he can fit in nicely to those three infield spots or in the left field. Uh, and contribute offensively, and he did that already, obviously, um, in the last game or two. So, um, you know, the Giants, I think, were used to them going into a lull for a period of time uh, during the course of the season, and they were winning a lot of ball games with this uh, duct tape put together with Pence out and Panic and Duffy out. Um, and they managed to hold on to their first place spot. And right now, I think with Pence back in the lineup, I really think that optim- you know that psychological aspect, his presence in the lineup, is going to make that club turn about a little bit. Now, obviously, Hunter can't pitch. The bullpen, the middle, middle, you know, middle relievers, etc., um, and even our closing situation hasn't been what we uh, would desire, but I think that just psychologically having Hunter back in that lineup is going to make a big difference with the club. Yeah, um, he's their motor. I've said that before, and uh, it goes beyond the statistics. Uh, this guy's motor is always going, and he's he's up in the clubhouse, and um, it's nice to have him back, no question about that. No doubt about um, it. He is uh... He and Duffy have the same have the same injury with the answering, except Hunter tore his and he missed forty eight games and they and they rested him and they had to keep him from being his own worst critic and that's what the that's what they're making sure with Duffy right now. And I know both you told Duffy he goes, We got Nunez we got Nunez to protect you from hurting yourself further because if he tears that thing if he tears that thing, then he's going to be done. I mean, and now it's a strain right now for Matt Duffy. And so the point is that with the strain, as opposed to a full tear, I mean, Hunter, Hunter Pants, I, I, I forget which leg it was, but he's only got two, he's only got two, he's only got two ligaments in one leg right now because the third one already torn, it was already torn. And so now, and so now Matt Duffy is like, he wants to play, clearly he wants to play, but you got to protect players from themselves sometimes. I mean, players Wait, Duffy, is, it, is it an Achilles tendon or is it a – Well, still, it's still – any any type of those ligaments, though, you have to protect themselves from them because you don't want them – you don't want them going all out and something happens, whether it's in the hamstring, whether it's in the – whether it's in the uh, uh, knee or whether it's in the Achilles, wherever it is, Ralph, it's just like uh, – you, you don't want you don't want to do more damage, and that's the whole thing. And that's why this thing. That's why I think this trade was actually very good. I like New York. I don't know if you guys remember. I, you know Ralph. You know New York baseball. He, he was I'm the heir apparent to Derek Jeter. He was there. Yeah, I know. I know you did. He was the heir apparent to Derek Jeter. They loved Nunez, and they wanted him right there to be the next shortstop uh, after Jeter retired. And it just didn't work out, and they ended up trading him. And he, he had an All Star year with Minnesota, and they traded this year. He'd been there a couple of years, and he did well with them. And now he's a giant. Now he's in the pennant race, and and he's going to do whatever it whatever it seems like to be able to play. Him. And with Duffy I'm being injured, I'm trying to remember what the Yankees got for him for Minnesota. They I think they got a I think they got a pitcher. I don't remember exactly either, but uh, 
So whatever they got for him, whatever they got for him, Minnesota was definitely wasn't better. enough. That's for and, the now the Giants, That's for the and now the Giants and now the Giants are benefit and now the Giants are benefit for it because he can play third and and Duffy can Duffy doesn't have to have pressure coming back on him to to come back and the Giants will look, won't put pressure on it. That's the way the organization is, Ralph. They will not put pressure on a player to come back sooner than he should because of the Hunter Pence situation. He came back last year from being injured. And, uh, and and it hurt him for the and it hurt him for the end of the year last year. Is there anything else in the middle, or is this the only deal they're going to make? Well, they got to get some relief pitches. There's, there's no doubt they need they need somebody in there. They're running out of arms down there. Okay. Were they in I contention thought, for Chat? Were they in contention for Chapman? Or they did want they did want to roll the Chapman. They did want to roll the Chapman. Um, but they weren't going to give up. They weren't going to give up the prospects of the Cubs that the uh, Yankees were asking for. And uh, okay, if they still want that. Andrew Miller, Andrew Miller will. Andrew Miller might, might or might not be available. We, we talked last week, and it was like we have no idea if uh, we have no idea if the Yankees. Well, I, are I don't think at this point with Chapman going, I don't think the Yankees are going to give up number two. And I don't think the Yankees ever uh, consider themselves in rebuilding mode because it's almost impossible right. in New York City to con- yeah. conceive the year. It's just, especially with the Mets, go, you know, have, quote, mm-hmm. taken over the city. And that was a while back when the pitching was still healthy. Yeah. But um, it's a different mentality. They're, they rebuild on on to go. They will rebuild from day to day. Um, so I'm glad they got some prospects for Chapman um, from that standpoint. Um, I heard they were in contention. I, I heard they asked about Mark Lanson. And Mark Lanson just got traded from the uh, Mark Lanson just got traded from the uh, from the Pirates to the Nationals today. So, and oh, yeah. Because, Pab- right. because Pabalbon's been exploding, you know, in a bad way. So I think that's a uh, so I think that the, the Melanson trade will will help the Nationals a little bit. I'm not sure if he'll be here tomorrow. Uh, well, that they, doesn't thrill me, but that's I'm all right. Um, teams teams get better, teams get worse. Um, I don't know what the Mets are going to do between now and then. I would like to see them get Lacroix, but that um, uh, from Milwaukee. But that's that's another story. Tell me a little bit about the pitching on the Giants, guys. What's going on, and um, how do you see it? Timmy, let's start with you. Well, you know, I, I think, um, you know, to the credit of Sabian and, and Bobby Evans, I think, you know, they are not a panic group. They don't do knee-jerk kinds of things. Um, you know, that's been, been pretty much what they've exhibited over the last several years. I think that they are confident in the young arms that they have in the bullpen. I think that they, the, the, the guys that are there now have been a little bit disappointing, but I still think that they believe that there's a great amount of talent. Remember, they don't have a lot of major league experience and they're, they're kind of learning on the go, on the fly. Uh, you, you know, you've had Lopez was out for a little bit. Sergio uh, is back, I think, back on the DL after coming back. Um, you know, so those are your experienced guys out of the ten. Having lost um, the uh, left-hander last year, what was his name? The 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 guy that we lost to retirement. Oh yeah, um, um, Jeremy Yeah, and, you know, yeah. and and trying to develop kids like Strickland, uh, Derek Law, and Osich, and, and some of these guys. Um, you know, the, these guys are really learning at the big league level. Um, as far as Casillas going, uh, has gone, you know, he's really, he's blown a couple of days. We see that. He's a nail bite closer like so many of the guys are in the major leagues. But I think he's going to be fine. Those, but we have to those three World Series wins, those Romo and those, those nail biters, um, they got the job done. And they've got that in the back of their heads. That they've won before, and that's that's very important. So, Giants are at a big advantage, mindset-wise. Once you've done it, you know you can do it. Uh, Absolutely, and it does. But uh, you know, they they 
I think they realize that their bullpen isn't as good as they would like it to be. If there's something feasible out there for them where they don't have to give up a whole lot or they don't have to pay a lot for a guy that's established as far as a closer or whatever, sure, they're going to do that. But I think that the Giants have demonstrated, even though we're only a game and a half up right now as we sit right now, Dodgers are getting beat as we speak, but they're still in first place. You know, we have a tendency to get a little bit excited about things like this, and, you know, the, the we think that the roof is caving in on us. We're still one of the best teams in Major League Baseball, even after going through two weeks of horrific baseball. Uh, and I think that we saw a little bit of a glimpse of, of what the club is like today. You know, I mean, in a, a five to three win, um, you know, good solid pitching from PD, good starting pitching. Um, you know, their, their effective offense, moving guys around the, you know, from station to station, uh, and catching it. No errors, you know, catch it, throw it. The Giants are in baseball. You're talking about playing horrific baseball. I think Crawford is amongst the five most solid shortstops in baseball. This five. I give top three. I give him top three. I would, I would have to say he's probably, with the exception of the um, the outstanding career seasons that maybe Story's having and Seager with the Dodgers, and they just happen to be in the same division as the Giants. I think before the All-Star break, uh, Brandon Crawford was in conversation of being an MVP in the National League. Of course, he was only hitting about 275, 278 at the time of the break. But let me tell you this. Brandon Crawford is worth a lot more than what you see from a statistics standpoint. What no, he no, does no. defensively and the runs that he saves um, and, and the incredible defensive uh, plays he makes, that guy is probably, if not arguably, the best. My question, Timmy, he's terrific. My point is this, and maybe I'm using him as an example. In two days, he made two errors in each game, two key errors in each game. Now, people make mistakes. What? That happens. That that expression, speed never slumps. A de- you get what you get from a defensive guy, and it's, he's more apt to be. You're more apt to see a, a level defensive guy all year long than a hitter who's up and down and slumps this and that. What causes incredible defensive slumps, Timmy? Is it concentration? Are they thinking about? Well, I, I you know, I, I don't. I don't know if he's, he's having an incredible he's tired. He's tired. He's tired. Yeah. He plays every day. I, I, I tell you what, Ozzy Smith and Omar Bell. The equation. I want to talk just in general. You see guys, and that's pretty much. I'm sure that's pretty much it. Guys getting ruts. They're tired. They. You're right. They're playing every day. They need a rest. So, with that in mind, Nunez becomes a better acquisition. Totally, without a doubt. The more we I'll, yeah, take, I'll, take, I'll take Brandon Crawford and Anthony Simmons as my shortstop any day. Right. Absolutely. So would I. Absolutely. And um, and you know what? Uh, Brandon Crawford's a human being. He's going to make some physical mistakes. It's those mental errors as, as uh, coaches and staff. Those are the ones that you don't want, you know, to happen. But the physical things, that's baseball. The greatest shortstops of all time, Luis Aparicio, Ozzy Smith, Omar Vizquel. Hey, they had some bad games too, you know, and it just happened. It's the way it goes. Um, There's nothing wrong with Brandon Crawford, believe me. Well, you guys know, you guys know when a shortstop makes 15 to 20 errors a year. Granted, you don't want a lot of errors like Marcus Simeon did last year, although he's improved too this year with the A's, but. If a shortstop makes 15 to 20 errors, that just means he's getting to 15 to 20 more balls than other shortstops are getting to. Exactly. Absolutely. And, uh, errors of enthusiasm, I think. Give me errors. I, I think I think that's a great call. Absolutely. That was Branch Rickey, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure that um, Crawford is great. Just the question, I guess, is in general just what makes teams slump. 
there's no accounting for what makes them slump offensively. I don't think um, one could ever put their finger on that. Um, yeah. Can I make one point? Can I make one point here, Ralph? Sure. You mind if I make one point? So I was. So I have a friend that does a radio show up in the Sacramento area. So I was, we were talking pre, pre-trade deadline and post-trade. I'm going to do a post-trade deadline with that. But uh, we were talking about how um, the Giants came out on a slow start. Would this have been, and Tim knows, he's followed baseball his whole life and with everything, and so have you, Ralph. And I was saying if the Giants, if it wasn't right after the All-Star break, when everybody was paying attention to it, would a 2-9, and 11-game slump be as big of a deal was in the middle of April or in the middle of May as opposed to right after the All-Star break. It yeah. happens. Everything very, very goes through it. Yeah, it's a, it, and, it, and, and, and what's going to happen? Really happen so nobody they, was, they had the best record in baseball. Right. Um, sure. And they're still right there. They're only a game back of the Nationals and, and, and they might be tied with the Nationals now. So. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, in April and May, if you went 2-9, in the middle of, like, you know, April 22nd to April, you know, or May 2nd, would it have been as big a deal as it had been right after the All-Star break when they were paying attention to baseball right after the All-Star break? I, I think not. Yeah. Very, very good point. Um, you know, we don't do enough anymore about memories, Giants memories. Vasu, what was your first memory of going, of seeing Willie Mays? How about that? I never saw one. I'm too young to see All right. Well, that, that was a short memory. How about that might have been? Uh... <laughs> I've seen a lot of highlights. I've seen a lot of highlights. Hey, we got a kid on the show. We got a kid on the show, Ralph. Oh, oh. Can, right. I, give you, can I give you a giant memory, though? When I Actually, I Timmy, I got two kids Go ahead, on Timmy. the show. <laughs> you were a kid, too, by the way. <laughs> That's too. Give us your your number one giant memory. My number one giant memory? No, that's well, not that's, Yeah, okay. It, so my, first, my number one so giant my, memory is sitting with my grandfather when I was um, four and a half, not yet five years old. My parents uh, would go to Europe a lot. You know, they would go and left me with my grandparents, with my mother's mother and her husband, my, my grandfather. And... Um, he had, he was semi-retired, much like I am now. Oh, well, I'm semi-retarded. That is a little different. <laughs> I was tired. But, um, and or you're just tired. Or you're just tired. He, he was just tired of, uh, of Rose Ness, but that's another story. Um, so he would say, Rose, we're going to a baseball game. And my grandmother would scramble around and make sandwiches and put them in a brown paper bag. And she'd make sure we had a pencil because when you buy a scorecard, a scorecard was 15 cents. A pencil might have been a dime. She, so we took a pencil with us. And that, but the first one was sitting in the right field grandstand right next to, to um, Don Mueller, who was playing right field. Willie hadn't even been caught up, called up yet. It was in early 1951. I think it was opening day because my grandfather never miss, missed an opening day, and I can't imagine that he would have gone without me that year. It was my first year of going to games. But the Giants hadn't called up Willie, and he was, I can remember him pointing to guys, Don Mueller here, they call him Mandrake, and then he pointed over to first base, and it was number 25, Whitey Lockman. And what, it was kind of funny to me, because he had blonde hair, hair and Al Dark was not a black man. <laughs> so Whitey Lockman was a white blonde guy, Al Dark was a darker white guy, but not a black, not black. And all those very confusing with names and, and what have you. Stanky was playing second, and um, Hank Thompson was was playing third or maybe. And yes, that's what it was. Bobby Thompson was playing center. And the next time I went to a game was after May 23rd. They called called up Willie, and it changed the entire configuration of the Giants. Bobby Thompson went to third. Um, Willie played center naturally. 
And, uh, so where, I'm sorry, Ralph. Let me interrupt. Where was Bobby Thompson playing? Was he playing the outfield? He was playing center originally. Oh, uh, okay. And, okay. Uh, I didn't know that. Okay. Monty Irvin in left, and uh, once they got Willie, Bobby really did uh, kind of became almost. Uh, he wasn't as good a third baseman. You had Hank Thompson at third. He had a lot of depth. Um, it just changed things. For a while, Monty Irvin played first, and. Um, and Whitey Lockman played left. So I have all these memories of center field, uh, of the polo grounds, but I want to just share the one that sticks out to me. They hit a ball deep into the right field corner, and Mueller is digging it out. And I can remember my grandfather and I, right in front of our eyes, there's Willie as Mueller didn't have a good arm, and Willie's going, gimme, 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 and he's got his, his hands out for the ball, maybe 20 feet away from Mueller. Mueller pegs it to, to Willie, and Willie turns around and throws a bullet into the infield or wherever. But I remember the look on Willie's face with his eyes wide open, gimme, gimme, gimme. And after the play, my grandfather's looking at me, and we'll go, we're both going, gimme, gimme, gimme. It was the coolest thing as hell for a, a little kid. And I'll tell you one other thing. After the game, in those days, they'd open, the, you know, you see the wall and the old polar grounds? That was like a gate, and it would open up, and it would go out into the street. It would go out to, so after the game, people could come on the field and, you couldn't really run around the bases so much. They had, uh, you know, ushers in the infield. They didn't want to mess up the infield. But we could walk and walk in that hallowed outfield out towards the exit through the back. That was a thrill for a kid. I don't think they have that in any ballpark anymore. No, not at all. Not, well, they, that you can walk through, certainly the center field fans with ATB open up, but not for public consumption. But, uh, yeah. And another thing you don't see, get to see much is batting practice. You can get there very, very early and not, not see batting practice. It's taken off times in cages under, under the clubhouse. Um, and really, um, that's a big thing that I miss as a fan is getting to see batting when they used to roll out the cage from center field. I don't know if... Timmy remembers that in the, in the polar gra- in um, in Candlestick they roll. I do remember that. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you, we don't get to see stuff like that anymore. Which um, you know the pregame stuff, the things that uh, make you come back, the memories for kids, because it's really all about kids and passing it on to to the kids, and that's the, the beauty of, of it. Who took you to your games, Vasu? I know who took Well, my, yeah, my, my, my mom and dad, we went, when I was a kid, we, we grew up in Southern California, so the first, the first games I saw were Dodgers games, and I had the transistor radio, and my neighbors, we were in Manhattan Beach, in the mid-70s, and so I was listening to Vince Scully, kind of got me on my right. broadcasting thing, even though I never, even though I never really thought about broadcasting in those days, and even after college, I never really thought about it, so about four years after, I acted, but I ended up in it, but, uh, I would be. I would listen to Vince Kelly on the transistor radio late at night, and in those days during the summer when it was warm, I would just sit out there on the on the uh, driveway. And my neighbors would come over and play play a little play a little uh, baseball or whatever in the street, and we'd have the game on and all that. And then, and we really you, mean just, you used to listen to your dad on the transistor radio when they were on the road, huh? <laughs> yeah, I never really no listen to Vince Kelly on the radio in those days. But my no, no, I'm and, talking Timmy. Timmy, oh, Timmy, yeah. 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 How cool! How cool was that? Well, you know, I mean, I I remember Vin's call when Dad. Oh, let's see, this was either '68 or '69. Um, you know, I was in bed, laying in bed, listening to the game on my little radio, my little transistor. Vin's calling the game, and Dad came up. Pinch hit in the bottom of the ninth against Camilo Pasquale. They were playing Montreal in a three to nothing game. Two were out. Bases were jammed. Uh, bottom of the ninth, and Dad had worked the count to a full count. 
and he, I think it was a nine or a ten pitch at bat, and then he got a pitch that he hit over the center field fence in Dodger Stadium, and that, you know, I remember that call uh, like it was yesterday. I mean, I could wake up in the morning and hear Vin in my head. Um, you know, that, uh, my dad had an affinity to come up with some big hits late in the game. He, too, you know, because of the – the atmosphere and the people that he played with, the guys that he played with, you know, when you're around that, it's so infectious. I mean, it just, um, you become better when you're, you're playing with better players. Dad had the opportunity to play with, you know, what, six, six Hall of Famers. So, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a very special treat, uh, for a ball player to be able to, uh, you know, have that opportunity. Um, you know, my my memories are all blurred. They're like a train wreck, really. But what I remember the most is just running into that clubhouse at Candlestick, and Dad's locker was down kind of out of the way. It was kind of like in a little narrow spot where Mike Murphy and Eddie Logan used to uh, have a closet for storage, and Dad's locker was right across from that opening, that doorway to that closet. And it seemed like almost every day, you know, there was a bunch of guys right around my dad's locker. And the only way to get to my old man was to crawl, you know, get on my hands and knees and crawl underneath these legs of the reporters and get to my dad who was sitting on his stool. And then he would just pick me up and put me on his lap. That's what I remember more than anything. Um, But believe me, I've got a gazillion memories, you know, that, um, uh, you know, the Maze, McCovey, Bobby Bonds, um, uh, I mean, I some... Hear, today I want to hear about Hiller, Charlie Hiller. Charlie Hiller, the Jack Hiller. He hit that, Jack he Hiller. that granny in the World Series, did Charlie yeah, Hiller. He did. And he later played with the Mets, so I got to have an affinity. <laughs> well, all I recall really about Chuck Hiller, because I was really young then, and I wasn't even okay. born in 62. Dad, Mom was pregnant with me in the series, because I was born in February of 63. But my dad and Chuck Hiller, I don't know what it is, why I say this, because it, it, it applies to all the guys my dad played with, if I remember. But my dad and Chuck Hiller were best friends. You know, they were really? best of friends. But the funny thing about it was, I'm finding out my, my dad was best friends with everybody. Um, I don't think that there was a single person, um, with the exception of one guy I got just recently. Uh, somebody on Facebook said your dad was an asshole. I don't even know who the guy was. Uh, but that's me, like one me, one me, one me. One he, oh, he, he was an idiot. Anyway, so, you know, obviously <laughs> that guy... You know, he probably got, he stopped taking his medication. Did he, did he have reason? Because he had no logical reason. Not at all. Nothing. It was just, it was, your dad's an asshole. And I said, oh, really? Well, why? I mean, tell me. Because I've never heard anybody refer to my father that way. And he never, he never responded. So I figured he probably didn't take his medication that day or something. You know, I mean, that's kind of, kind of where that was coming from. I'm thinking, wow, that's pretty harsh. But you know what? Why would you say um, that? Why would one say that? And, you know, that's what people are, Ralph. It's on social media. That's what people do now. That unfortunately, I see it a lot. Yeah, they throw out. Yeah, they're snipers. You know, they just throw stuff out there and then they go hide. You know, they don't have the courage. It's easy to make comments. It's easy to make comments because you know you want to be called out on it and all this other stuff. So that's just the way it is now. Dude. Well, yeah, there's really one of the problems with the internet. It's almost like uh, there's an impersonality of. Um, well, there's no accountability. You know, I mean, there you can get away with a lot. You won't get called. Yeah, you won't get called out on it because if somebody says some five said ten howlers or so and so, I mean, on the yeah, on well, Facebook I'd, or whatever, then I'd be like, you know what? Great. What's Tim Howler going to do? Put it out on the internet. Yeah, and. uh you know what? I, I and 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 that's just life. That's just the way it is. And and I'm I'm pretty aware that you know you can't make everybody happy all the time. Um, and uh, you know I just found it, I found a little interesting that somebody had. Re- I know Frank Robinson didn't didn't you know really love my dad a whole lot, but that's okay. <laughs> I mean, I don't think he thought my dad was an asshole. No, no, no. You know, I didn't know that. Well, I even remember saying, 
we talked privately and I sent you a message and not knowing that they didn't get along. Um, well, you know, I, I mean, I don't even think it was, I don't even think that their relationship was, uh, it was, by the two of them, they were both, they misunderstood each other. You know, uh, we talked a little bit about Lowell Cohn's article he wrote years ago about all vanilla and no chocolate and that whole racial thing. Um, and, you know, that, that underlying thing. He had Vita, he had McCovey, and he had Mike Robinson's manager. So for Lowell Cohen to say that, it just makes him, in retrospect, sound like a fucking idiot. <laughs> well, mean, well, he is an idiot. I mean, I've never, I've never had, I've never had a lot of respect for Lowell Cohen anyway because of all the things he did. He may have re- written good political columns and whatever else he did, and however else he left. But I know a lot of people in my business, local media here, especially you know between Sanjar and that, they're all like. They're all like nobody. Nobody takes Lowell Cohen seriously anymore. So. Yeah, and I don't want to sit here and bash Lowell Cohen because you know what? He's a human being, and he deserves. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sorry I, I used that I, word. Well, yeah, I know. And, and you know what? I don't want to give Lowell, Lowell Cohen any sort of ammunition to want to 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 want to be Lowell Cohen. You know what? He's a human being. He's entitled to his opinion. Oh, well, you know, that's just the way, it, hey, we're all, we all are entitled to that. Um, and I'm not here to bash Lowell Cohn. I'm just right. saying that that was part of the underlying thing to the whole um, miscommunication between my father and Frank. I think there was a great amount of respect for each other, the two of them. But some things got misconstrued because of the article written by Lowell. Now, that's been, what, 40 years ago? So yeah. um, let, let's get over it. <laughs> I mean, oh, there's I a lot of things that have happened since then. No, I know. I'm just saying, I'm not attacking him. I know he's, he's an older guy. And he's doing his thing and all this stuff. Yeah, but I'm just saying that when a lot of people that I'm in, in current, current, current status with a lot of people, and when a, if one person says, I mean, if, if, one, if you two said something about me, I wouldn't think of it. But then a year, four or five people said the same thing about me. Then it starts to become, then it starts to become truth. I'm not saying he's a bad guy, I'm not saying he's doing anything else, and I'm not bashing either, but I'm just, in terms of Will Cohen, I'm just like, I, I'm, I'm not a fan, and that's my opinion, so therefore, that's just the way Well, I'm not a fan of him either, but I don't wish anything bad on him, I mean. No, 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 no. I don't wish anything bad on him, I'm just. No, I don't either. either. Yeah, but I just don't to, have respect. I don't want guys, would, I, I don't like guys, and I'm, I've been in this town, this is probably why I'm not more famous, because I don't. I don't do what they call yellow journalism, and I say You're right. You don't do shock journalism exactly. Shock journalism. You just do your job. And I think he was ahead yeah. of the game in shock journalism, honestly. And, and I see some of the stuff that people talk about, and I hear the questions that he asked at 49 press conferences, and I I see what he says at, at other things, and I'm like, why would you? Ask? I'm thinking to myself, why would you ask a question like that? It has nothing to do with the original subject matter, and that's that's the problem that I have with people. You yeah. Know, Jeff you guys know who Jeff Perlman is, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, um, yeah. Jeff Perlman is, right? I don't know, I don't know how to put that. I'm the sorry right. I overreacted and used that word. Yeah. Um, no, that's all right. Case. I mean, but Jeff Perlman, the Sports Illustrated writer, he would write. I do. He, write, he, he wrote the book. He wrote the book on the on the Mets. He wrote. Um, I think he wrote, he wrote the, the book John Rock guys story. lost. Yeah, he, he, exactly. I'm just saying that yeah. kind of journalism. I don't think that's again. That's why I'm not. That's probably where I'm not. Why I'm not where I am because because I, I just won't do it. I, I would rather at least come up to people and talk to people and say, look, hey, I wouldn't do my job if I didn't ask you. You're allowed to say no comment, but don't don't shock people and don't say don't say don't say something that without at least talking to somebody first before you print it and or put it on the radio or put it on air. And that's just the way I've always been. Yeah. Well, Timmy, I'd like to thank you for um, for making the 1980 Giant Highlight film available. <laughs> Very I'm nice. famous. Very nice. You had McCovey Day on there, and I want you guys to know, I think I might have mentioned this to you, Timmy, that I worked for um, Doug Emmons in the ticket department. 
um, and would would get tours of people to come, groups of people to come from Sacramento. And one of the groups that I put together was for that Willie McCovey Day in 1980 that was uh, shown on that film. And I could remember being there at that game. I did took a bus with like 40 people or whatever it was and to each bus that was pretty cool um oh the names yeah, um and the unis it was terrific so keep them coming to me where'd you get I, 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 I love that i will never forget that day as long as i live because i was working i was doing bats that day and willie came up and got that base hit to win the game and I'll tell you what, the, it was packed at Candlestick that day, too. They were, it was sold out. I don't know how many people were there, over 50,000 at least. Um, and when I went out to get the bat, the, the place got, it was the loudest I'd ever heard a ball, a ball, the stadium, ever. And I've been to a few. And I'll tell you what, that, that base hit that Willie got, um, it was like I was walking ten feet above the ground. It was it was just surreal. It was like being a part of a dream, and to have the opportunity to go out there and pick up his bat. I'll tell you what, for a, a sixteen or a seven, it's like, yeah, seventeen year old kid. I mean, wow, what a what an incredible thing! You know, I got I had the opportunity to get out there and uh, shake guys' hands after hitting ball, you know, home runs and game winning base hits and plays at the plate to win a game. You know, I can remember Mike Shadak and Daryl Evans and and Jeff Leonard and Billy Davis and Jack Clark and um you know that to just have that opportunity to see these young men because they were all in their twenties, um, you know, to play this game and, and play it at that level. I I remember I got chills one night sitting on the at the in the dugout bench. You know, Willie Cubby was a very quiet guy. He didn't say a lot. But I remember one night he was standing out at first base, and there were probably about 1,500 stands, people in the stands at Candlestick. And first inning, and uh, I don't even remember who's pitching for the Giants, but it might have been uh, Lynn McLaughlin and was pitching for the Giants. And Stretch McCovey's out there, Max out there at first, and I hear him. You know, chattering. Hey, babe, hold, hey, throw some strikes, baby. And I'll tell you what, that shit goosebumps up my back. Uh, just to, you know, I mean, wow. It was cool. Nice. Um, I remember that, I remember that, uh, I remember that William McCabe year of 1980. I was living in Irvine, California as a 12 year old. And I saw, as, on the Dodgers broadcast, I saw that game. And if I remember right, as a 12 year old, and Timmy would know because he's there, but uh, that was the first game of double header that he had a double to dock in the winning run, and everybody crammed all over him and all that, and then they had to go play a second game. And then I remember a week later, right the Sunday before the All-Star break, my family took, my, my mom and dad took me and my, my family to Dodger Stadium to see Don Sutton give him a suitcase and saying, we wish you well, but thank God I don't have to face you anymore at Dodger Stadium. It was that. Uh, it was the year the Dodgers Stadium put that uh, put the brand new quote unquote diamond edition in in 1980, and I remember they uh, would they had a big ceremony for Willie McCovey on the uh, Sunday before the All Star break. So, uh, it, it, if we're going back to the earlier part of, of my giant memories, then that probably would be my first giant memory since I lived in Southern California and had more uh, more Dodgers memories in my younger youth than, than I do the Giants memories. But I do remember the Willie McCovey day, and I do remember seeing I was in Irvine, California, in a house. Watching this game, watching the Dodgers and Giants, and watching Willie McCovey come up in the bottom of the ninth inning and knock that run in, and uh, it was mobbed, and you were there, Tim, so you know, mobbed and everything like that. And I remember Bill North jumping on him. He was a Dodger in the '77, '78 World Series with the uh, with the Dodgers in those days, and I remember seeing him right. specifically jump on Willie McCovey in those days. So absolutely, I, I totally remember that time, and I'm like, I'm like, oh, I'm 12 years old again, listening to Tim Howard. And we're also going to talk about Willie McCovey in those days. <laughs> nice. Hey, guys, this is really cool. Um, thank you very much. We've had, uh, as usual, fun, which is what it's about, isn't it, Timmy? 
when you stop. Uh, I, I love it. And that's too, thank you um, for being on the show again. I, I really enjoy your sharing and your, your, you know, everything that you contribute, and I can't wait to have you back on again. Yeah, maybe we can, uh, maybe, uh, maybe we can be a real contributor to the network, and uh, I'd like it to start right here because uh, we have a good combination, and it's fun, and that's, that's the name of the game. And, I'm in. Uh, Whatever you guys want, I'm in. All right. All right. Timmy, thank you. Hey, uh, Sue, thank you. Gentlemen. And those of you guys out there, just keep on keeping on. That's the only thing I can say. Life's a long run. It is not a dash. It's a marathon. So keep it steady, and uh, we'll catch you next week. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Thank All you. Right. Bye-bye. Thank you.